Once you start bailing in on in any significant way, it's all gone anyhow. But it's a way of pretending that you have more capability than you really do have. And then, as I said in the leaflet, it also is spurring a whole category of higher interest yield uh, instruments or debts uh, or bonds, which have been, which are, which are, which can be bailed in, and the and the investor is made aware of that. Of course, the smart investor goes ahead and purchases those or invests in those because they have a higher yield and they know that if this thing starts to go, it doesn't matter. Everything's going to go if they're smart, so they, they get a higher yield off of it. But, conversely, under the existing laws, the fact that the bank is, uh, is uh, the fact that you purchased a bank uh, debt that has a higher yield, which is bail then they then the, then the bank can say, well, we have a more a total loss absorbing capability. So it's a, it's a, the whole thing's a fraud to maintain the appearance of that the system can, can continue. It's also a threat. So, uh, so but when it goes, it goes. Okay, and, and nothing can stop it, and, and no balance can stop it, and no, uh, and, and, and so forth. So, so, so that's what we're, that's what the leaflet kind of implies for, for the people, um, for the people there. So, on, on, I just wanted to add an addendum uh, to what Robbie has said. Now, uh, tonight I want to get across uh, just what is happening on a global scale that is unprecedented in world history. What we're witnessing right now is an unprecedented situation where we have a civilization that's oriental, emerging, and is now eclipsing Western civilization. This is spectacular. Uh, European civilization in its worst elements, its colonial elements, has been running the world since the 1500s, since the 1500s. And that is coming to an end. And a Asian-based civilization is going to, is with a very different view of, 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 of things. Hi, Hi. Hi. With a very, very, an Asian civilization with a very different view than Western civilization, but but coherent with some of the best of Western civilization, is now emerging, and and this is spectacular. This is spectacular, and it, this is uh, perhaps the most spectacular shift in, in world history since since the since the emergence of uh, of, uh, of European colonialism. And uh, uh, so now I'm going to start with a specific. Um, somebody I, I, I cherish very dearly, the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov. He, he's very special. I've, 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 listened, I've, heard, I've seen his statements over the years. Now he, he compared, he, re, he referred to Stalin's state prosecutor in the 1930s, Andrei Vyshenko where most trials would only last a day or two, and then, um, but before they would have a trial, they would extract a confession. And confessions were obtained. And confessions were the queen of all proofs. Right, if you confess to a crime, that, that's proof that you committed a crime. Or you committed a whatever. An enemy of the state or whatever. Now he's saying the U.S. is completely undone, outdone what Stalin uh, had done. <laughs> And that accusations are the queen of all proof. <laughs> he also is maintaining that the problems all stem from Obama, the Obama administration and Obama, which crafted and created multiple delayed action land mines, political landmines, geopolitical men, which are going off. And an example of that which are going off all over the world. 
No. Then he went into how nobody has presented any evidence of Russian involvement in the U.S. elections. And then when he was discussing with Tillerson, Tillerson told him, yes, you guys were involved in, in, in our in, in meddling in our election. And when he asked uh, for proof, Tillerson said it, it's uh, classified. <laughs> 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 well, we've heard that one before. When, when people, the FBI used to, used to say, LaRouche is a bad guy. We have the proof. Well, where's the proof? It's classified. Okay. Now, he said that the confliction in Syria is occurring, but it's not enough. And then if, 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 the, if the U.S. backed Syrian Democratic forces threaten uh, Russia and the Syrian um, Arab army, they're going to be dealt with. And he made it very clear. And in this context, we, we have confirmed that 850 al, al Nusra were killed in an, in an operation that was backed by the U.S. to try to take control of a, of a, of a, of a Russian um, base. And there's this whole fight around the oil and gas fields that are on the other side of the Euphrates. And he made it very clear that these are Syrian, not, not not U.S. not U.S. or Kurdish, um, and that only a unified Syria is, allowed, is going to be allowed. You know, no, no dis, dis, disunity. So he's taking a very firm stand on behalf of Putin, and so 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 what is going on inside the U.S. Uh, that's going to be something we'll deal with later. Now, Trump's speech and its implications. Now, you have to understand how the British operate. They create incidents. And then they play both, they play the incidents. And they use their, you know, the echo chamber of the media and their hired, their, 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 their lackeys, their, their agents to play it. So you're, you're, you're constantly being hit with all these so-called crises, the North Korean crisis, the Iran, you know, the North Korea minefield, the, the Iran minefield, the Ukrainian minefield. So you've got three major minefields, and, there, and there's others. And then you have smaller minefields, and they all, they, they all explode, you know, in every which way you can imagine. Uh, and they have their politicians, and these are coordinated. So Donald Trump comes in with a three-point program, uh, deal with immigration, no more wars, and economic nationalism. And, but he ha he's coming in, but he has no institutional power. He, has no, he, has, he doesn't have any institutional power. He's just the guy that the people voted in. So he's now wading through all these minefields. Now, Trump's speech was praised by Lavrov because Trump's initial statement of principles is completely coherent with what Putin put forward much earlier at the United Nations. But then there's that part of the speech where he talked about, you know, rocket man, you know, uh, bringing doom or whatever, bringing uh, whatever. And that's totally insane. Uh, and then the thing he said about North Korea and Syria was also insane. So what gives? Now, more than anything else, we have a schizophrenic strategic crisis inside the US. Don't look at it as Trump is this and Trump is that. Trump is Trump. But he, he is responding to a psychotic breakdown in the institutions at this time. A psychotic breakdown in the institutions at this time. And I'm going to go into this, this psychotic breakdown, which is unavoidable. We can't avoid having the entire, most of the entire institutional structure of the United States go into a psychotic breakdown. It's just not possible to avoid. I'm sorry. Now, 
We have to look at it from the standpoint of the elites, not from our standpoint, but from the standpoint of the forces that came in with Bush. <coughs> they were already present during the Clinton administration, a bit Bill Clinton's administration, but they came into full force with Bush and then and then and then and then Obama. And in their view, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the end of history. And we would now have a world governed according to the looting principles of Wall Street and the city of London. And that no nation would ever interfere with that. And you also had the emergence of this idea that future conflicts would be not conflicts between communism versus capitalism, but future conflicts would be clash of civilizations. Or, um, and this was Samuel Huntington and, and Brzezinski. Now, what's happened is that the, their, their utopian worldview has been shattered. And this is a large part of the establishment. And, it, and what makes them different than the British is that the British, when they see something shattered, they tend to, to, they tend to shift and try to, make it, try to survive it with a certain reality. Because, the peop because at the highest levels of the British establishment, they are more sophisticated. They know they have a, better, they have a greater sophistication. And, and they have a greater evil also. But these people who believe in this worldview, their worldview has, is, is shattered. It's completely shattered. And here's Donald Trump in the White House, and that shattering process is hitting Donald Trump. Like, I cannot, I, you know, from within his own government, from within his military, elements of his military, from, from within his, uh, the institutions, like this guy McMaster, who, who thinks he's built a better mousetrap. <laughs> you, know, you know how these people, they think, they keep, they, they get really fixated on a problem, of how, he's, he's been fixated on a problem, how you win a war, how you win a war against the Russians. And he thinks he got a better mousetrap. Unfortunately, he's, he's a national security advisor. <laughs> now, so they created a clash of civilization as, as the, as the, as the, uh, uh, mainly with China in mind, and also using is the uh, ramping up the um, the, uh, the the Muslim Brotherhood and the and the and and, 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 the, and the Wahhabi operation. Now let me explain something. This didn't come on all of a sudden. This was all planned before the fall of the Soviet Union. And then when the Soviet Union fell, you had the Balkan Wars, you had all these guerrilla wars in Africa, all these genocidal wars in Africa being unleashed after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Zaire, now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, Sudan, Nigeria, Northern Nigeria. You, you have all of these genocidal operations taking off and a large part of those genocidal operations were, were about getting control of raw materials. Uh, various different uh, oligarchical uh, entities were, were trying to get hold of the raw materials, get control of the raw materials. And the best way to do that is to move the people out, kill most of them, and, and control them. And for decades, they've been called, since, uh, since Afghanistan, uh, the war in Afghanistan, they've been cultivating with uh, the Wahhabi element and the Muslim Brotherhood element, and creating mercenary armies based on the uh, based on this, with London up until around 2000, London being the, the coordinating center and the, and the main incubation place for all of this, and and they accelerated this after the fall of the Soviet Union, and their idea was to create a permanent war between Shia and Sunni. To just create total destruction, chaos, and then have that chaos then blow back into the into Russia, 
through their uh, Muslim uh, uh, and into Pakistan and into uh, the Turkic uh, regions uh, of China, and just as just as one operation, this was planned. This was the new world disorder, <coughs> as some call it. And then came 9/11, then came Iraq, then came Libya, and now it's Yemen. All this war, set, all of this war set into motion was financed by drug trafficking, by the Saudis, by the U.S., by the heroin production in Afghanistan, through the Balkan, through the uh, Kosovo and Albania, but they couldn't, but at the Balkan Wars are what set up these uh, criminal, uh, 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 criminal states, Albania and Kosovo. Meanwhile, during the same period following the collapse of the Soviet Union, you had an explosion of environmentalism, explosion of the Green Movement, explosion of the, of the terror of climate change, explosion uh, starting around 1971 with the Rio Conference, and the onslaught of the Greens has been relentless, growingly growing since. So this is all one package. It's not one little thing here and one little thing there. That package doesn't go away because Trump got elected. Now, there's a U.S.-Canadian side to this, which is very real. We have a tale here in the northwest of two cities, Vancouver, Seattle. Both cities are seeing spectacular uh, high-rises, IT, all of this. They're being transformed as a model for the new city of the new world order. The working class in these cities is pretty much driven out. Uh, the, the real estate costs are too much. And a technocratic elite administering this post-industrial information society is, emerges. And these are, these are people, uh, <coughs> the, most of the people in IT are just drones, but then you have the more creative people. And then, because they have no sense of production, a lot of them, they, they, there's, a, there's a strong green aspect to this. And the collapse of industry, the collapse of mining, the collapse of logging, and particularly these areas, has driven the rural populations into deep poverty and extreme uh, issues of drugs. One of the big ones is methamphetamine. <coughs> and I went to some of the surrounding areas uh, uh, recently. Um, which used to be somewhat prosperous. Well, they weren't that prosperous, but, but when I went there, they were, they were drug infected. The entire downtown was full of, of these small, uh, medium-sized towns were infested with drug addicts and, 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 and hyperactive methamphetamine people riding bikes and, and just, just, you know, going like this. And you look into their faces and <coughs> it's horrifying. I mean, not just one or two, but dozens and dozens and dozens of people whose lives are probably going to, going to be extinguished in a matter of two years, and who, <coughs> who many others are, are, are going into it. And when you go to Seattle, you see the same thing, and all kinds of different places, you see this kind of thing. And, um, and, and these are towns that didn't have this problem until recently. You know, and you have all these addicts wandering the street, trying to trying to get enough money to stay to stay on whatever it is they're, they're, they're doing, and and it, it is a horrific, horrific to look into these people's faces, and horrific to look at these people, and they are, to me, they are they are almost the equivalent of the of, to me the horror of watching them is almost like me seeing a photograph of starving children in Africa. It has a similar effect on me. And, <coughs> and it's, it it's also has a horrifying effect on the population because they see these people. And it just, it, it has this horrifying effect. And it's just multiplying all over the United States. And in Canada, too, in the rural areas of Canada. This has happened, the same thing. And in suburban areas. But it's a little different, but it's, it's these, these, these rural areas are disintegrating. Now, 
<coughs> this is the consequence of the same policy. This is the consequence of the same policy. It's no different. And in large cities, which aren't, aren't the so-called new mecca uh, of the new system, where the poor are in neighborhoods, the same thing is happening there. I mean, you get gangs, and uh, it's just it's just horrifying. And there is no no hope. It's just it's just death, methamphetamine, opiates, crime, alcohol takes a little longer. And so you have you have Canada and the United States are dying in this sense, just like Africa. Although Africa is dying probably worse, and the Middle East is, is dying tremendously. And this is all part of this policy. This is all part of these policies. And some of that is responsible for Trump getting elected. The desperation with which people, uh, they said, okay, this guy said he's going to do something. Well, you know, we're, we're going to vote for him. Now, <coughs> now, but there have been two devastating blows underway to all of this. And this is now unfolding. And the first begins with the Russian military intervention to help the Syrian government and the uh, Syrian uh, army. And to the Russians, and to me also, both in reality and, and metaphorically, <coughs> Syria is the, was the Stalingrad of the whole situation. And what Russia did occurred at the last possible moment, just before Syria was about to be overrun by U.S.-backed terrorists, British-backed terrorists, Saudi-backed terrorists, Turkish-backed terrorists. And, and Obama and the British were looking at a, at a victory of their system, because had, had Syria gone, then that would then the whole thing would have gone in a certain direction. And their, their game plan, their policy would have now spread throughout the world. And Syria was the last stronghold of a secular civilization that was left after Iraq, which was also a secular civilization. And Egypt was the other secular civilization in the region. And Palestine was a secular civilization. It still has the potential of being there. Now, Syria is the Stalingrad, metaphorically. And if you all know what happened after Stalingrad, is the forces started to emerge out of Russia. The, 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 the Nazis, the, the onslaught was stopped. And then forces began to emerge to counter the, to uh, a counteroffensive. And we are now in the civilizational counteroffensive against this barbaric, satanic system on a global scale. And that's where we are. And this is what is going on. Now, the one belt, one road is not a nice idea that China picked up from Helga and Lin. It is the counteroffensive of civilization against this genocidal, satanic barbarism that was taking over the world. The world is dying, but now some parts of the world are starting to have hope. Some parts of the world that have been left to die are starting to have hope, and they're starting to be revived. And the Russians are providing the crucial and strategic military backbone while the Chinese are coming in with the economic development. Now, I, I have neglected to study uh, the leader of China. I have not read any of his uh, books that, he, that have been translated into English. I have not followed him enough. And this is, a, this is a, uh, something I should have done. Um, because this is this this who is this individual and what makes him different than let's say previous Chinese leaders 
But what makes them different? And what I can tell you are just a few things that I that I've discovered, but but by no means am I am I uh, do I have a real sense of who he is. From from roughly 15 to 22 years old, he did backbreaking agricultural manual labor in one of the poorest areas of China. Um, he was he was born into the leadership prior to the Cultural Revolution. His, his father came back as a, a member of the Standing Committee under Deng. But during that period of the Cultural Revolution, when his father was uh, eventually put in prison or eventually uh, forced, he, he had nobody protecting him. And he was in manual labor for seven years in one of the poorest areas of China. Now, what kind of person <coughs> is it <coughs> who has those kind of roots? Who has that formative period of his life integrated, integrated into the peasant population of China? What images does he have of China? What images does he have of the people that he worked with? Now, another thing that I noticed today, I was looking him up and I saw this, uh, this uh, thing where he, uh, um, uh, there was an article, uh, he's, he's, putting, he's putting the Chinese leadership through another, another whole reorganization. He did a whole reorganization, you know, with a large portion of the party officials in prison or under under investigation. Now he's going through another purge. And I saw in this article that he has just forced the ouster of the top youth organization leader. And so <coughs> what they did is they created a communist youth organization, which is not the party itself. But this party youth organization is uh, the substrate from which the, a lot of the party uh, party people come in, and it has supposedly like eighty to ninety or hundred million people in it, and and what he he according to this article, he criticized the whole communist youth movement as a bunch of arrogant sloganeers who had lost touch with the youth of the nation. They were doctrinaire, party, party slogans, and they had no, no, no humanity. And all they want to do is repeat party slogans. They don't talk about science. They don't talk about literature. They don't talk about uh, poetry. Wow. And they are completely disconnected from the actual youth of, of China. Now imagine these people go on to become the anointed leaders of China. And they're not in touch with the rest of the population. A, a population which is undergoing tremendous uh, elevation in their educational level and, and their culture. So, so he's, he's, he's now taking on, according to this art, you know, according to this art. Now, <coughs> now, what kind of person is that? That's a person that has a vision of the future, if, if I'm correct. And he's bringing about that future through a process. He's seeking to bring that future about through a process of, of, of taking on the party and changing the party. Now, so the publication called China Daily which has had these uh, um, reports on the Schiller Institute's uh, relationship to the <coughs> Helga and Helga and LaRouche's relationship to the Transaqua, written by uh, a China Daily reporter, and then, and then the piece on, on Helga in the, uh, in, in, in the 
What is it? The global time? What is it? What is that? China deal. Right. And uh, so they finally put together a huge conference of 400 uh, individuals from, all, from 126 countries. And these are all people representing uh, media organizations in those countries, including the United States, Bloomberg, uh, in England, uh, Financial Times. And one of the individuals that was invited as part of this was one of, one of our members, uh, Mike uh, Stager. And he went there. And what, so Mike is giving us a report of his conversations with people. He's, he hasn't really put together a full report, but well, what, what, what happened is that a lot of the news organizations who know us, who think that LaRouche is you know, off the wall, uh, are trying to figure out why we're there, why he's there. And then he was one of the 14 people picked out of this 400 <coughs> to be part of a research group to advise the China Daily, to be advisors to the China Daily on, on, on everything. And, uh, and then, so they had this conference in, uh, uh, in a place called Dong Quan, which is about 120,000 people. It's, it's, it's right at the, end, at the beginning of the Old Silk Road in the northeastern part of China. And the conference was on the media and the Belt and Road. So the whole conference was on the media and and the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, that's what the conference was about. Was the media and that. And after after that conference, they all went to Beijing. All the 400 plus went to Beijing. Sat in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. <coughs> top party, uh, top leadership was there. And the key guy was Vice Premier Zhang Guali. Gaoli, Gaoli. And he's the vice premier, and he's on the standing committee, and he's the one in charge of the entire uh, One Belt, One Road project, of the whole Belt and Road initiative. And he was there. And Mike got to sit with the editor, Mike got to sit with the head of China Daily, at the table with the head of the China Daily. Uh, and he said, that, that, the head of China Daily likes to drink. Everyone at the table likes to drink, so it was quite a raucous uh, event, sitting with the head of the... And, uh, and what the Chinese were saying to these media people is, look, all we want you to do is give straight coverage on what the One Belt, One Road is doing. We're not asking you to, to embellish